The Woven Figure, Conservatism and America's Fabric by George F. Will, abridged, read by Vincent Bagnall. The University of Michigan scholars, who are preparing a dictionary of Middle English, have extracted from the mists of the past a word for what many Americans feel describes the current condition of their country's politics. Spatiocyte. It means a hollowness. Certainly in the century's 10th decade, American politics has taken on a pastel cast. The bold colors of unfurled banners are but faded memories. The shouting dies. The captains and the kings depart, and perhaps the banality of contemporary politics should be a national boast. The deflation of politics is not a bad coda to a blood-soaked century. Indeed, the miniaturization of American politics has its own fascination, especially given the fact that government, although currently disparaged, has a recent record of substantial successes. Far from producing uncontrollable deficits, by the mid-1990s, its revenues matched outlays for programs, which is to say the budget would have been in balance but for debt service, and as a result of a lot of social learning, inflation, which 20 years ago seemed like a disease endemic to and perhaps destructive of democracy, is controlled. So our business cycles, which within living memory produces surges of unemployment huge enough to threaten social stability. Granted, there have been other less happy dimensions of social learning. In 1966, when Sergeant Shriver, head of President Johnson's War on Poverty, was asked how long it would take to win the war, he replied about 10 years. Still, we have largely eliminated one kind of poverty, financial distress among the portion of the population that possesses the accumulated social capital of good habits. Not a bad record and not one calculated to make Americans ripe for revolution, as some Republicans should have considered. Around A.D. 982, Eric the Red, explorer and pioneer of the public relations business, named one of his discoveries Greenland, because it wasn't. He hoped the name would lure colonists. He soon learned the limits of creative labeling, and so have those practitioners of American politics who have bandied the word revolution. They have learned the limits of politics as an engine of abrupt change in a free and complex society that is neither able nor inclined to divorce itself from its past. The aspiring revolutionaries have called themselves conservatives, so they should have known those limits. A cardinal tenet of conservatism is that social inertia is and ought to be strong. It discourages and, if necessary, defeats the political grandiosity of those who would attempt to engineer the future by rupturing connections with the past. The Republic is a woven figure disinclined to unravel the threads that connect it. Here, then, is a paradox. The recent disappointments of some conservatives actually vindicate conservatism's critique of extravagant aspirations. However, these years have not been, on balance, disappointing for conservatives or uninteresting or uninstructive to anyone mindful of the conversation of this continental nation. These years have featured a particularly intense recrudescence of the familiar American argument about what government is and is not good for. It is an argument about whether many of our discontents are caused by or can be cured by government. As a result of these years, some conservatives are wiser than they were. They should not be sadder because they have acquired a virtue, a quickened appreciation of politics. From the wearing loom, the tyranny of nonchalance, Pursuant to the Motion Picture Production Code's mandate that no picture shall be produced which will lower the moral standards of those who see it, the script of Casablanca from 1942 was changed, the word like replacing enjoy in what was originally this line for Captain Renault's you enjoy war, I enjoy women, 
The Hayes Office, an enforcer of the code, issued this edict after reviewing the script of the African Queen from 1951. There must be no unacceptable exposure of Rose's person, played by Catherine Hepburn, as she tucks her skirt up into her underclothes. We assume the intention here is to tuck the skirt under the knees of her bloomers. America has liberated itself from not only such pedophagery, but also from what is now considered the tyranny of taste. So, is everyone happy? Not exactly. There's a certain troubling lack of refinement in Dennis Rodman's America, a lack linked to three peculiar ideas. Distinguishing between liberty and license is incipient fascism. Manners are servants of hypocrisy. Concern for appearances and respectability is a craven treason against self-expression, hence not respectable. The eclipse of civility is a fact fraught with depressing significance, as explained in the autumn 1996 Wilson Quarterly in essays by Richard Bushman, a Columbia historian, and James Morris of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. The gravamen of their arguments is a coarse and slatternly society. Boomboxes born through crowded streets by young men wearing pornographic t-shirts and baseball caps backwards. Young women using in what formerly was called polite society, language that formerly caused stevedores to blush, jeopardizes all respect, including self-respect. Bushman says the young American nation had to overcome the fear that gentility, the product of an elite culture, put common people at a disadvantage hence compromised democracy. But as American lives became less and less governed by austere material conditions and austere religious codes, rules of gentility, young George Washington was required to read 110 rules of civility and decent behavior in company and conversation, supplied governance for human nature's unruly impulses. Bushman defines gentility as a compulsion to make the world beautiful beginning with the individual and extending to the home. A piano on a carpet in the parlor, polished walnut furniture, ceramic dinnerware, and to parks and museums to elevate the public's taste. Gentility stimulated a market for many of capitalism's goods, and capitalism democratized gentility by making those goods affordable. As urban density came to a formerly frontier society, Bushman writes, the premium on simply getting along in public grew. There were uniformed ushers in theaters, sometimes distributing printed rules of decorum, such as not talking during the performance. Behavior was better when cinemas were opulent. Bring back the printed rules for the boors, whose minimalist manners are suited to today's multiplexes. Time was, writes Morris, Americans understood that rules of civility do not just smooth surfaces, they inscribed the soul. And today America is a nation of voluble solipsists, chatting away on cellular phones in public, unconcerned for privacy or dignity or safety, a bumper sticker, hang up and drive. Morris warns, in this age of whatever, Americans are becoming slaves to the new tyranny of nonchalance, whatever. The word draws you in like a plumped pillow and folds around your brain. The progress of its syllables is a movement toward a universal shrug. It's all capitulation. No one wants to make a judgment, to impose a standard, to act from authority, and call conduct unacceptable. So this nation, where traditions have the shelf life of bread, is getting perhaps not the behavior it deserves, but that which it countenances. Why even the meek drive like Masala out to teach Ben-Hur, who's boss? The future stares blankly at us through the eyes of the fragile young men and women in Calvin Klein ads. In a conga line of pointless sexuality, having opted for a new cologne over bathing, in the imperturbable cool of the 1990s, writes Morris, sights that not so long ago would have left audiences open-mouthed with wonder, leave them droopy-eyed with boredom. To every age, perhaps, its proper surfeit 
In old Rome, worried impresarios probably cut deals for more spears, more tigers, more Christians. Today's is not the honest coarseness of frontier settlers removed from society and struggling with bears and the seasons. It occurs in a land where plenitude inflames the sense of entitlement to more of almost everything, but less of manners and taste, with their irritating intimations of authority and hierarchy. Today, Dennis Rodman. What next? Whatever. December 22nd, 1996. Conservatism's Several Threads An epithet no more. In 1950, a man was arrested for creating a public disturbance. A witness said, he was using abusive language, calling people conservative and all that. Yes, once upon a time, and not so very long ago, conservatism in America was widely considered, at best, an eccentricity. And conservative was an epithet. When Clinton Rossiter revised conservatism in America in 1962, seven years after he published it, he added a subtitle, The Thankless Persuasion. Today, that may be the only dated aspect of what he wrote. It is as certain as anything in politics can be that for the foreseeable future, conservatism in America and what Rossiter wrote about it will be more interesting to more people than could reasonably have been expected when Rossiter published the book in 1955. Conservatism should not be called an idea whose time has come, because, as Rossiter understood, conservatism is a complex constellation of ideas and dispositions whose fortunes have waxed and waned throughout American history. And clearly, conservatism is a more potent political force than it was when Rossiter first wrote about it. Its relative weakness was one reason he paid so much useful attention to the long history of cultural conservatism in America. Those of us who are pleased to be called conservative are inclined to explain the improved political fortunes of conservatism by saying that the truth will always prevail and leaving it at that. But then proper conservatives are skeptical about the power of mere truth to reform a naughty world. Surveying the littered landscape of America's recent social history, it is not hard to discern events that lent conservative truth a helping hand. The Great Society legislative initiatives were quickly perceived, fairly or unfairly, as having promised much more than the government was competent to deliver. The Vietnam War and Watergate deepened skepticism about the competence of government and stimulated skepticism about the good motives of government. The turmoil of the years 1965, the Watts riot through 1975, the fall of Saigon, induced in many people a conservative insight. The crust of civilization is thin, and the traditions of civility are brittle. Unrest on campuses and the intrusion of federal affirmative action and other regulations into academic life helped bring forth a conservative intellectual movement. But history is the history of ideas, of mind, not of autonomous events shaping minds. The history of conservatism in America is at least as confused as the history of almost everything else in America and has become more confused since the ranks of conservatives have begun to grow rapidly. This, this country takes ideas, and the words that convey them, seriously. The ideas and vocabulary of American politics derive directly from the liberal democratic tradition of the 18th century. It sometimes seems that many American conservatives are unreconstructed classic or 19th century liberals who would be recognized as such in a European context. Furthermore, this country was founded by liberal gentlemen who made a conservative revolution. Many of the most revered figures of the liberal tradition from Jefferson on were temperamentally conservative, and conservatives are inclined to consider temperament as important as doctrine in politics. Writing the book was, for Rossiter, a somewhat thankless task. He certainly got little thanks from many conservatives. He had to impose a semblance of order on a disorderly jumble of disparate but related impulses, and he had to make explicit the implicit relationships between kinds of conservatism. To do this, he adopted a latitudinarian approach to defining conservatism. This exasperated those conservatives who regarded conservatism less as a political program for winning and wielding power 
than as a church militant more devoted to preserving the purity of its doctrine than to converting the world. Among those who have been placed in the conservative tradition are Alexander Hamilton, among the architects of national power, and Albert J. Nock, the author of a reverent biography of Hamilton's great rival, Thomas Jefferson. Jefferson, the advocate of decentralization, and his rival John Marshall, whose jurisprudence consolidated federal power, Andrew Carnegie, industrialist and the Southern agrarians, critics of industrial civilization, John C. Calhoun and William Fitzhugh, South Carolinians, whose doctrines about states, rights, and slavery helped produce the Confederacy, and Lincoln, whose thought, with not a little help from the Union Army, defeated the Confederacy. Theodore Roosevelt, an inventor of the modern presidency, and Robert Taft, who sought the office by promising that he would conduct it differently, any condition of conservatism elastic enough to encompass Ayn Rand had better find room for the Walter Lippmann who wrote The Public Philosophy from 1955. The Western liberal tradition has many saints, Locke, Paine, Jefferson, Mill, to name just four, but conservatism in the modern age has one fountainhead, Edmund Burke. Among America's founding fathers, John Adams was the closest approximation to a Burkean, and since then, as Rossiter knew, traditional conservatism has been in the custody of literary rather than political persons. Herman Melville, Henry Adams, Paul Elmer Moore, Irving Babbitt, William Faulkner, James Gould, Cousins, and more recently Herman Wouk, Walker Percy, and Mark Helprin. The preeminence of Burke in the Western conservative tradition is, or should be, a bit embarrassing for those American conservatives who seem to think that conservatism is capitalism, no more, no less. Burke knew that economic thinking, although necessary, is too thin a gruel to serve as a political philosophy. He thought that economic reasoning encouraged a desiccated, rationalism inappropriate to a rounded understanding of the life of society. That is probably why, in a particular denunciation, he lumped economists with sophisters and calculators. Thus, it is strange that conservatism, twice in the Gilded Age and again today, has come perilously close to disappearing into an economic doctrine and it is passing strange that this doctrine, laissez-faire capitalism, should be most skillfully advocated by a scholar, Milton Friedman, who punctiliously notes that he is not a conservative at all, but a classic Manchester liberal. The natural, by which I mean Burkean, conservative dubiousness about politics controlled by abstractions is admirable, but some American conservatives added for a while a less wholesome suspicion of ideas, or at least ideas other than a particular economic doctrine? There were three reasons for this. First, by identifying themselves so thoroughly with the American enterprise system, and by ascribing so much good to the entrepreneurial impulse, conservatives came to distinguish too emphatically between people of thought and people of action, and to identify too much with the latter. Second, Respect for free markets as rational allocators of resources became, for some conservatives, an almost irrational faith in the solution of all social problems through spontaneous, voluntary cooperation in markets. And this produced disparagement of political ideas, which conservatives associated with government planning and direction. Third, conservatives thought intellectuals had a vested interest in disparaging markets because markets work so well without the supervision of intellectuals. However, in the 35 years since Rossiter's revised edition appeared, the intellectual landscape has changed a lot. There are many more conservative journals, organizations, and columnists, and liberalism seems, not least to many liberals, to be intellectually tuckered out. It would be quixotic, not to say confusing, to try to pull the American usage of the word conservatism into line with traditional usage in the Western political tradition. European conservatism has generally been defined in terms of historical phenomena that have little, if any, relevance to American experience. And these phenomena include the uh, clericalism and established churches, attempts to preserve well-defined hierarchies of social classes, resistance to popular sovereignty, and disdain for commerce. 
The way Americans use the word conservatism strikes Europeans as peculiar. They see Americans packing into the idea of conservatism some ideas that are, if not flatly incompatible, at least in tension with it. Truth be told, contemporary conservatism sometimes is as confusing as it is vigorous. Some persons say that their conservatism primarily concerns governmental due process. They emphasize judicial restraint and federalism and contend that conservatism is as much about the correct allocation of governmental powers as it is about the advancement of particular policies. Others argue that libertarian social policies that expand commercial and personal freedom, whether by legislation or litigation, are the essence of conservatism. And still others say that the basic conservatism criticism of modern society is that there is altogether too much freedom for abortionists, for pornographers, for business trading with Russia, for young people exempt from mandatory national service. A problem discerned by Rossiter is an incoherence in conservatism that is closely identified with free market economics, the severely individualistic values, and the atomizing social dynamism of a capitalistic society conflict with the traditional and principled conservative concern with traditions, among other things. Those other things include the life of society in its gentling corporate existence in communities, churches, and other institutions that derive their usefulness and dignity from their ability to summon individuals up from individualism to concerns larger and longer lasting than their self-interestedness. Society frayed and mended, Oklahoma City, from the fevered minds of marginal men. The Tennessee marble on the side of the Morgan Bank building in Lower Manhattan still bears defiantly scars inflicted on September the 16th, 1920, when a horse-drawn wagon loaded with sash weights exploded amidst a lunchtime crowd. Among those blown to the pavement was Joseph P. Kennedy, and he was among the fortunate. The blast which shattered windows over a half-mile radius, killed 30 and injured more than 100. There were no arrests, no explanations. Someone probably had taken too seriously some socialist critique of capitalism, but the incident fed J.P. Morgan Jr.'s many phobias, which included the Jew is always a Jew first, and the American second, and the Roman Catholic, I fear, too often a papist first, and an American second. Today, as the nation sifts and sorts the many jagged and tangled fragments of emotions and ideas in the aftermath of Oklahoma City, it should remember that this was not America's baptism of lunacy. Bleeding Oklahoma City is a few hundred miles down the road from Potawatomi, in what was once bleeding Kansas, scene of a memorable massacre. John Brown's body lies a-moldering in the grave, but his spirit, massacres in the name of God, goes marching on in the paranoia of a few. A very few on society's far fringes, which is progress. After Brown killed the mayor of Harper's Ferry and seized the arsenal, he was sentenced to be hanged. Yet America's preeminent intellectual, Ralph Waldo Emerson, said of him, The saint whose fate yet hangs in suspense, but whose martyrdom if it shall be perfected, will make the gallows as glorious as the cross. Morgan wrote the words above Jews and Catholics to A. Lawrence Lowell, president of Harvard, of which institution Morgan was an overseer. It is unthinkable that such sentiments could be expressed in such circles today. Today, with the fevered minds of marginal men produce an outrage like the Oklahoma City bombing, some people rush to explain the outrage as an effect of this or that prominent feature of the social environment. They talk as though it is a simple task to trace a straight line from some social prompting through the labyrinth of an individual's dementia to that individual's action. Now, to be sure... It is wise to recognize that ideas, and hence the words that bear them, have consequences. Those who trade in political ideas should occasionally brood, as William Butler Yeats did when he wrote this about the Civil War in Ireland. Did that play of mine send out certain men the English shot 
Did words of mine put too great strain on that woman's reeling brain? Could my spoken words have checked that whereby a house lay wrecked? However, an attempt to locate in society's political discourse the cause of a lunatic's action is apt to become a temptation to extract partisan advantage from spilled blood. Today, there are those who are flirting with this contemptible accusation. If the Oklahoma City atrocity was perpetrated by individuals gripped by pathological hatred of government, then this somehow implicates and discredits the current questioning of the duties and capacities of government. But if the questioners are to be indicted, the indictment must be broad indeed. It must encompass not only a large majority of Americans and their elected representatives, but also the central tradition of American political thought, political skepticism, the pedigree of which runs back to the founders. The modern pedigree of the fanatic's idea that America's government is a murderous conspiracy against liberty and decency, a money-making idea for Oliver Stone, director of the movie JFK, runs back to the 1960s. Those were years John Brown could have enjoyed Years when the New York Review of Books printed on its cover directions for making a Molotov cocktail. And a student died when some precursors of the Oklahoma City fanatics practiced the politics of symbolism by bombing a building at the University of Wisconsin. Today, when some talk radio paranoics spew forth the idea that the AIDS virus was invented by Jewish doctors for genocide against blacks, it is well to remember that the paranoid impulse was present in the first armed action by Americans against the new federal government. During the Whiskey Rebellion 200 years ago, a preacher declared, The present day is unfolding a design the most extensive, flagitious and diabolical. The present day is unfolding a design most extensive, diabolical, that human heart and malice have ever invented. If accomplished, the earth can be nothing better than a sink of impurities. It is reassuring to remember that paranoiacs have always been with us, but have never defined us. April the 25th, 1995. Policy, the First Amendment and the Speech Rationers. Surveying the constitutional and political damage done by two decades of campaign finance reforms, friends of the First Amendment feel like the man in a Peter DeVries novel who said, In the beginning the earth was without form and void. Why didn't they leave well enough alone? Reformers should repent by repealing their handiwork and vowing to sin no more. Instead, they are proposing additional constrictions of freedom that would further impoverish the nation's civic discourse. The additions would be the Forbes Perot codicils, abridging the right of a rich person to use his or her money to seek elective office, and this will be called closing a loophole. To reformers, a loophole is any silence of the law that allows a sphere of political expression that is not yet under strict government regulation. Jack Kemp, Bill Bennett, Dan Quayle, Dick Cheney, and Carol Campbell are among the Republicans who were deterred from seeking this year's presidential nomination, in part by the onerousness of collecting the requisite funding in increments no larger than $1,000. You may or may not regret the thinness of the Republican field this year, but does anyone believe it is right for government regulations to restrict important political choices? There are restrictions on the amounts individuals can give to candidates and on the amounts that candidates who accept public funding can spend. Limits on individuals giving force candidates who are less wealthy than Forbes or Perot to accept public funding. Such restrictions are justified as necessary to prevent corruption and promote political equality. But Professor Bradley Smith of Capital University Law School in Columbus, Ohio, demolishes such justifications in an article in the Yale Law Journal beginning with some illuminating history in early U.S. politics. The electorate was small. Most candidates came from upper-class factions, and the candidates themselves paid directly what little campaign spending there was, which went for pamphlets and for food and whiskey for rallies. This changed with Martin Van Buren's organization of a mass campaign for Andrew Jackson in 1828. 
democratization, widespread pamphleteering, and newspaper advertisements for the increasing literate masses cost money. Most of the money came from government employees until civil service reform displaced patronage. Government actions, civil war contracts, then land and cash grants to railroads, and protectionism did much to create corporations with an intense interest in the composition of the government. Then government created regulations to tame corporate power, further prompting corporate participation in politics. Smith says that in 1888, about 40% of Republican national campaign funds came from Pennsylvania businesses. And by 1904, corporate contributions were 73% of Teddy Roosevelt's funds. Democrats relied less on corporate wealth than on the largesse of a small number of sympathetic tycoons. In 1904, two of them provided three quarters of the party's presidential campaign funds. And by 1928, both parties' national committees received about 69% of their contributions in amounts of at least $1,000, about $9,000 in today's dollars. Only a few campaigns have raised substantial sums from broad bases of small donors. These campaigns have usually been ideological insurgencies, such as Barry Goldwater's in 1964, $5.8 million from 410,000 contributors. The aggressive regulation of political giving and spending began in 1974 in the aftermath of Watergate. Congress, itching to do something about political comportment, put limits on giving to candidates and on spending by candidates, even of their personal wealth. Furthermore, limits were placed on total campaign spending and even on political spending by groups unaffiliated with any candidate or campaign. In 1976, the Supreme Court struck down the limits on unaffiliated groups, on candidates' spending of personal wealth, and on mandatory campaign spending ceilings. The court said these amounted to government stipulation of the permissible amount of political expression and therefore violated the First Amendment. But in a crucial inconsistency, the court upheld the limits on the size of contributions. Such limits constituted deliberate suppression by government of total campaign spending. And such suppression constitutes government rationing of political communication, which is what most political spending finances. Furthermore, in presidential campaigns, limits on the size of contributions make funding raising more difficult which coerces candidates, at least those less flushed than Forbes or Perot, into accepting public funding. Acceptance commits candidates to limits on how much can be spent in particular states during the nominating process and on the sums that can be spent in the pre- and post-convention periods. EPI, Phenomenal Politics, 1994-1938 Redux. Thirty years ago this Thursday, on the evening of October 27, 1964, supporters of Barry Goldwater's presidential candidacy bought half an hour in NBC for a pre-recorded speech by a private citizen who said, this is the issue of this election, whether we believe in our capacity for self-government or whether we confess that a little intellectual elite in a far distant capital, can plan our lives for us better than we can plan them ourselves. A few hours after the broadcast, the speaker was awakened at his Los Angeles home by a call from Washington informing him that the Goldwater campaign switchboard was still clogged at 3 a.m. Eastern time by callers contributing $8 million, $38 million in 1994, Sixteen years after that, the Speaker was elected president. In 1964, President Johnson won a landslide victory by using one of the first and most effective negative television campaigns and by telling Americans that greater government activity in the affairs of the people would produce a great society. But soon there came a conservative tide that has not yet crested in 1966, Republicans rebounded, gaining 47 House seats. In 1968, the combined Nixon-Wallace vote was 56.9%. In 1972, Nixon carried 49 states. In 1976, Democrats, facing a Republican Party still reeling from Watergate, won. But barely. 
and only by nominating the most conservative candidate who sought the nomination. Republicans won the next three elections. Then Bill Clinton won a 43% victory by advertising himself as a semi-demi-conservative new Democrat. The 1994 elections could resemble those of 1938. Those produced a powerful reaction against a president who had overreached his mandate. FDR had tried to enlarge the Supreme Court so he could pack it. Republicans gained 81 House seats, almost doubling their total, and joined with conservative Democrats in a coalition that generally prevented a liberal legislating majority until 1964 produced a two-year liberal episode. Historian Alan Brinkley believes that Republicans crossed a Rubicon in the late 1970s. They took their cue from Californians, who in June 1978 took government into their own hands, using Proposition 13 to slash their property taxes. Until the late 1970s, conservatives had argued, as Goldwater did, that many government programs, although popular, must be opposed because they take an intolerable toll on freedom. But the Reagan Revolution rested on the premise that Goldwaterite opposition to government programs was politically futile. So conservatives would attack taxes rather than the programs they support. This was Republican accommodation to the fact that voters were ideologically conservative but operationally liberal. Voters were conflicted, which is a polite way of calling them hypocrites. They talked a much more conservative line than they were prepared to have their politicians hew to. So, how about now? The election results two weeks from now will be sifted for signs that the country's still waxing conservatism is at last producing an electoral sorting out. Beginning in 1968, Republicans won five of six presidential elections, but could not translate their presidential majorities into realignments farther down the ballot. For example, 10 years ago, Reagan carried 375 of 435 congressional districts, but only 182 of the 375 elected Republican representatives. And in 1992, 103 congressional districts voted for Bush and a Democratic representative or for Clinton and a Republican representative. However, there is evidence that more and more voters are becoming operationally as well as ideologically conservative. The evidence is anecdotal, but enough anecdotes make a pattern. And here is one from Speaker Tom Foley's campaign for a 16th term. His campaign theme is that he brings home the bacon from the far distant capital. For example, he recently announced that his hometown of Spokane, which has a population of 178,000, is getting a larger law enforcement grant than San Francisco, which is a population of 724,000. However, a Spokane voter tells a reporter, the man has done a lot of great things, you have to give him credit. But you have to wonder how corrupt Washington is if a man can bring that much money from Washington. One reason for the public's steadily deepening disdain for government is the increasing reliance by politicians on negative advertisements of an increasingly scabrous sort. These are usually 30-second snarls that preclude subtlety. Such campaigning, which is now the norm because it is effective, serves conservatism for two reasons. First, campaigning in such short televised bursts is survival of the briefest. And conservatism's message, distilled to its essence, often is. No, less, stop that, cut it out. What that message lacks in poetry, it makes up in concision. Second, conservatism considers distrust of government and of people who crave political power a virtue. Today's acidic campaigning breeds such distrust. Consider California's Senate race. That state is so large, its population of 32 million is larger than the nation's population was when it elected Lincoln, that the only campaigning that matters is done via paid television. And the biggest bang for the buck comes from accusation and denunciation. Six months ago, Dianne Feinstein, former mayor of San Francisco and now Democratic senator, was California's most admired public official, regarded favorably by two-thirds of the voters. Her challenger, Michael Huffington, was an unknown freshman congressman, but by now, each has driven up the other's negatives so high that whoever wins will be the most disliked official in the state. And this is part of what Jean Bethke Elstein calls the spiral of delegitimation. 
Vile campaigning deters many decent people from entering electoral politics. Thus, the talent pool from which elected officials are drawn is small and brackish. Many of those who plunge into that pool are coarse to begin with and become more so by doing what it takes to win. With campaigns sounding like fingernails scraping across blackboards, voters come to despise all the authors of the awful noise, winners and losers alike. Perhaps there are lessons to be drawn from this fact. During this 30-year decline in the public's trust of government, Polls have measured a marked increase in trust only during the presidency of the man who 30 years ago denounced the overbearing nature of the far distant capital. October the 31st, 1994. A world still much with us. America's lost sense of the tragic. Brooding about the cataclysm of 1914 that shattered the long peace produced by the 1815 Congress of Vienna, Henry Kissinger wondered whether the protracted stability might have contributed to disaster, for in the long interval of peace, the sense of the tragic was lost. America's sense of the tragic, never strong, may have been bleached away by the sunny blink of peace, peace enlivened by the Gulf War, since the end of the Cold War, or so it would seem from the widespread incomprehension of the Conservative Congress's determination to spend more on defense than President Clinton desires. Liberal critics say this determination reflects the reflexive militarism of the right, or traditional pork barrel politics with the defense budget. Although undoubtedly some supporters of augmented defense spending are doing the right thing for the wrong reasons. It is the right thing. But it is not actually an increase in defense spending. Rather, the administration's defense cutting, speaking of reflexive policies, is being slowed. The Pentagon may receive about $7 billion more than the president wants, but that will merely hold the fiscal 1996 defense decline to 1.7%. And fiscal 1996 will be the 11th consecutive year of real inflation-adjusted decline in defense spending. Furthermore, although conservatives are generally disposed to prune government, it's hardly a behavioral anomaly for them to favor slowing the erosion of funding for the federal government's foremost responsibility. The contrast between liberal and conservative mentalities is especially sharp regarding defense, which touches more convictions about men and nations. Liberalism preaches, or at least holds out the hope, that people are infinitely malleable, and hence the present is endlessly manipulable, and the future is predictable. From this flows the recurring belief, it recurs after each time events refute it, that peace is the natural relation between nations, and that war is an aberration explainable by the bad character of rulers and by benighted traditions and institutions. For two centuries, liberals have been explaining the obsolescence of war, their explanations have often been hard to hear because of the roar of the cannon in terms of the spread of democracy, or the disappearance of religious and ethnic and nationalistic fervor, or the pacifying power of commerce, or the increase of travel, or the communications revolution, or whatever. However, as Donald Kagan dryly notes, over the past two centuries, the only thing more common than predictions about the end of war has been war itself. In his magisterial look on the origins of war, Kagan, a Yale historian, says that statistically war has been more common than peace, and extended periods of peace have been rare in a world divided into multiple states. In 1968, Will and Ariel Durant calculated that in 1968, Will and Ariel Durant calculated that only 268 of the previous 3,421 years had been free of war, and no year has been since 1968. Given what Kagan calls war's ubiquity and perpetuity, the first duty of political leadership is to act on the axiom that peace does not keep itself, and to understand that war, or the threat of it, 
has often been a surprise from Pearl Harbor to Iraq's 1990 invasion of Kuwait. The years between those two surprises contain such surprises as the Berlin blockade, North Korea's invasion of South Korea, China's intervention in Korea, the 1956 Soviet invasion of Hungary and the Suez Crisis, the 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis, the 67 Arab-Israeli War, the Tet Offensive, and the Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia in 1968, the 1973 Yom Kippur War the 1980 Iran-Iraq War, among others. So this has been a century of bitter surprises for optimists, such as the editors of the renowned 11th edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica, published in 1910. In it, the entry on torture said that the whole subject is one of only historical interest as far as Europe is concerned. Pessimists, realists who are not fatalists, should be guided by Sir Michael Howard, the British military historian. He writes that military power has three functions, deterrence and coercion and reassurance, and the last may be the most important for the preservation of stability because it determines the entire environment within which international relations are conducted. Reassurance provides a general sense of security that is not specific to any particular threat or scenario. The best analogy I can provide is the role played by the British Royal Navy in the 19th century. An American version of Pax Britannica will cost money, but will cost less than the ubiquity of war, which our sense of the tragic should tell us could be the alternative. July 16th, 1997. Weavers of their times, Thomas Jefferson, Clay, but uncommon Clay. Man, says Job, is born into trouble. As the sparks fly upward, use every man after his desert, Hamlet warns. And who should scape whipping? Verily, we are all made of clay right down to our feet. Modern man likes such leveling, deflating maxims because by stipulating a comforting equality of common sinfulness, they spare him the pain he likes least, the pain in the neck that comes from looking up at those who are rightly on pedestals. One of those made of uncommon clay was surely Thomas Jefferson. It is therefore a measure of contemporary fevers and confusions that Jefferson's greatness is continually under assault. A sulfurous new biography of Jefferson asserts, it is difficult to resist the conclusion that the 20th century statesman whom the Thomas Jefferson of January 1793 would have admired most is Pol Pot. We cannot even say categorically that Jefferson would have condemned the bombing of the federal building in Oklahoma City. The author, the eminent Irish scholar and statesman Conor Cruz O'Brien, rests his howitzer of rituperation on the slender reed of a single private letter Jefferson wrote in 1793 concerning the French Revolution. Quote, rather than it should have failed, I would have seen half the earth desolated. Were there but an Adam and an Eve left in every country and left free, it would be better than as it now is. It is meretricious to treat an epistolary extravagance as an index of implacable conviction. But then O'Brien, alighting upon the obvious, Jefferson was simultaneously a slaveholder and a paladin of political freedom with a sense of original discovery, has perpetrated a biography of the sort that novelist Joyce Carol Oates calls pathography, a shrill reduction of a rounded life to a catalog of dysfunctions it is bad enough, it is simple-minded elitism to say, as has been said, that a biographer should be his subject's conscientious enemy. But O'Brien is conscienceless. For example, he quotes Jefferson's early judgments of blacks' inferiority, but ignores Jefferson's conclusion 20 years later that blacks are on a par with ourselves. My doubts were the result of personal observation on the limited sphere of my own state, where the opportunities for the development of their genius were not favorable. Jefferson anticipated their reestablishment on an equal footing with the other colors of the human family. In February 1997, on public television, Ken Burns, whose accomplishments include acclaimed series on the Civil War and baseball, presented a timely corrective, a visually sumptuous and intellectually judicious appraisal 
of Jefferson. Burns, among various analysts, this columnist plays a small role, manages to be admiring without being enthralled. He recognizes that heroism is not saintliness and proves that a cool appraising eye need not be a jaundiced one. Burns examines agnostically the theory that Jefferson, who proclaimed equality when one-fifth of all Americans were owned by other Americans, had a long sexual relationship and children with a slave, Sally Hemings. The film unsparingly notes that Washington freed his slaves as did Jefferson's cousin John Randolph and Jefferson's neighbor Edward Coles. But Jefferson never did, even as Virginia's population of free blacks was rising in a 30-year period from 2,000 to 30,000. The film punctures Jefferson's pose of ambitionlessness. True, he canceled his newspaper subscriptions when he left Washington in 1793, but by 1801, as politically guileful as he was socially graceful, he was president. Ambitious as Oliver Cromwell and tough as a lignum nut, said John Adams, who was scurrilously attacked by a drunken editor paid by Jefferson. Jefferson, symbol of American optimism, died nearly destitute and was preceded in death by his wife, five of his six children, and his best friend, and in a sense, by the constitutional, political, and social order he cherished. But he produced what one of Burns' interlocutors calls the nation's making moment, the Louisiana Purchase, and provided an enduring model of how a free man with a fine mind and great soul lives amid the world's ethical tangles. None of us, no, not one, said Jefferson, is perfect. And were we to love none who had imperfections, this world would be a desert for our love. Many historians and others, in their intellectual crudity, immaturity, and mean-mindedness, respond to complexity with contempt and to excellence with envy. They pander to the democratic spirit gone, rancid in resentment of excellence, and they leave our national memory parched. Ken Burns, an irrigator, causes our capacity for political admiration for love of greatness in public people to bloom anew, February 16, 1997. Swatches from the century's end, hurrying to the next traffic jam. In 1955, Adelaide Stevenson, who was the intelligentsia's political pinup and was considered by advanced thinkers to be an advanced thinker, delivered the commencement address to those he called the gallant girls of Smith College. He said that they had a unique opportunity to influence us, man and boy. He urged them to restore valid, meaningful purpose to life in your home and to address the crisis in the humble role of housewife. He said they could do all this in the living room with a baby in your lap or in the kitchen with a can opener in your hands, and maybe you could even practice your saving arts on that unsuspecting man while he's watching television. Any speaker talking like that in, say, 1975 would have been hanged from a branch in one of the campus's stately elms by an enraged regiment of women, which is to say 20 years is a long time in modern America. Values change rapidly, a fact demonstrated last week when the Senate, disregarding the White House's characteristic defense of the way things are, set about undoing some regulations imposed 21 years ago. It was an instructive study in conflicting priorities and changing political fashions. In 1974, after the Yom Kippur War of October 1973 and the oil embargo and all that, Congress enacted a national speed limit of 55 miles per hour. Safety was one concern, but not nearly as large a concern as the energy crisis, which supposedly would be eased if everyone drove slower, thereby using less gasoline. And this was the same impulse that led the government to mandate certain fuel efficiency standards for cars. Those standards encouraged the production of smaller and lighter cars, which are generally less safe than larger cars and certainly have cost lives. The moral equivalent of war President Carter's description of the energy crisis, had more than just the moral equivalent of casualties. The energy crisis went away, partly because the supposedly imminent exhaustion of petroleum reserves was a fiction, partly because producing companies could not maintain their cartel, partly because the U.S. government did some dysregulating of the energy industry. The end of the energy crisis made some Americans, mostly liberals, very sad. 
because it had been a grand excuse to boss people around, telling them what and how fast to drive, where to set their thermostats, how to construct buildings, and so on. However, the national speed limit lived on, justified as a safety measure, which it was. It also was one of the most widely disregarded laws. Anyone traveling 55 miles an hour on the interstate risked the derision of the 95% of drivers rocketing past him and risked having an 18-wheeler in his back seat. In 1987, the federal limit was raised to 65 miles per hour outside of metropolitan areas. And this was not good enough for most Americans, who are always in a hurry to get to the next traffic jam. And it especially irritated the easily irritated people living in the vastness of the West, where it can be a 30-mile round trip to get a loaf of bread. And people do not want to spend more than 20 minutes doing that. Out there where men are men, rugged individuals all... They don't like the feds doing much of anything other than subsidizing their electric power and grazing and water and building the interstate highway system on which they soon, as soon as the House of Representatives gets with the program, can zoom as fast as their state legislators will let them. The speed limit issue, having been an energy issue and then a safety issue, now is a federalism 10th amendment state's rights issue with anti-paternalism in the bargain. So are the attempts to repeal federal laws that pressure states into requiring motorcyclists to wear helmets and passengers in private vehicles to wear safety belts. Remember the brief period when cars were built not to start unless seat belts were fastened? Some truculent Americans gave their cars hysterectomies to get rid of that wiring. The vote to repeal the requirement that highway distance signs include metric measurements is a heartening sign of national intolerance of the fetishes of busybody elites. One lesson of all this is that life is precious, but not priceless. If it were, we would set the speed limit at 35 miles an hour, ban left turns, they are dangerous, and motorcycles for that matter, and cheeseburgers. Another lesson is that the way we see and talk about all sorts of things is conditioned by the ideology of the day as the grandmothers who wore the gallant girls of Smith College's class of 1955 can attest. June 25th, 1995.